Hello everyone, welcome to another virtual event with Mysterious Galaxy. I am Nick, the director of events here for the store. I am here with, I always say this, but I really, really mean it tonight. I am here with two wonderful authors who in the past we have managed to have both in store and online. So it's just, again, having them here feels good, even a virtual space. Give a round of applause everyone from your various homes for Roshni Chashki and Adeline Grace, hello. <laughs> <laughs> Roshni, Hi. Is the, <laughs> Roshni is the New York Times best-selling author of books for middle grade and young adult readers that draw on world mythology and folklore. Her series includes the Star Touch Queen duology, the Gilded Wolves, and Arusha and the End of Time. Uh, we managed, we were able to have Roshni last year for Arusha and the Nectar Mortality, which was a fun event. Roshni, do you remember what was the furthest away someone came to your event? That was a little thing we had in your event. Oh, yeah, that was now I can't remember. But I remember that the answer made me very weepy. I was just like, you love me. You really love me. So and they we... don't. They, they were just like, who is this person? <laughs> what they love is Aru, and I'm glad for that. So... <laughs> we thought the furthest person away was Washington State. And then someone with a very strong accent goes, oh, we came from Ireland. So oh, yeah, I was I, you can't beat that. <laughs> <laughs> So they won, hands down. <laughs> they won. They won. And as I mentioned, we have in conversation Adeline Grace, the New York Times bestselling author of All the Stars and Teeth, which was named 2020's biggest YA fantasy. Her latest novel is Belladonna. We cannot wait for her upcoming Foxglove. Um, and I'm going to get this out of the way right now because it always comes in any sort of event that Adeline's a part of. Uh, she is also an aficionado of everything Digimon, just so you know. So if you have any questions... <laughs> That you want to ask Alan about Digimon, she's there for you. <laughs> All right. Uh, for those of you who have yet to purchase your own copy of The Last Tale of the Flower Bride, what are you waiting for? Do it. It's a great book. Um, our own, uh, one of our own booksellers, Kelly Ann, has said that Chashki's debut adult um, is uh, Silvia Moreno Garcia meets Gillian Flynn. The perfect page turner for fans of dark fairy tales and domestic thrillers alike. Dun dun dun. What you want. <laughs> um, and then for those of you who have purchased your copy of The Last Tale of the Flower Bride, we will be getting signed book plates for those. So just we'll let you know when those arrive. Um, and if you click the link below, you'll also see uh, some of her backlists as well as Adeline's books. Make sure you support both authors. Supporting them also supports us to do wonderful events like this. If you have any questions you would like to ask Roshni during the event, I see two of you have already found the Ask a Question button. Uh, make sure to click that, submit your questions, uh, and we'll answer them later on. All right, I'm going to disappear for now, but I hope you all have a good event. See you later. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> um, so before before we talk, I have, to, I have to tell the people who are watching what has transpired in the past five minutes because... It's probably going to happen again, and it is also a reason why I'm I'm, I'm not with you guys in person. But um, I was laughing so hard because that's usually what happens whenever I see Adeline. She's a, a she's a, a very devious mix of intelligent and witty and hilarious. And I was laughing so hard that I flung my eyelash away onto the floor, and Adeline kindly said, "I, th I think your eyelash just fell off." I had no I was just like like this, and I was like, "What?" And she said, I, I wouldn't have noticed if it hadn't, well, first fallen on your cheek and then toppled gently um, to the ground. <laughs> so if I do that again, which is why I keep fussily arranging my hair, I just don't want to knock them off because they're magnetic lashes and I bought knockoff ones. Um, and this sort of ties into the reason why I'm not with you guys in person. I, I really wish I was. And also the reason why I have to use magnetic eyelashes, but I'm incubating a kraken and I can no longer reach my bathroom counter to put on mascara because I get in my own way. And also the body is just difficult. And so here we are. Uh, but anyway, I would appreciate your well wishes for, for me and Little Kraken. That's all. <laughs> Please watch out for my eyelashes. They have a, they have a mind of their own, the sentient things. So. I'll let you know if they, uh, if they uh, decide to fall off again. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Uh, never buying knockoff glamatics again. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's nice to get to chat with you. I'm sorry, too, if you guys hear, like, creepy scratching in the background. My dogs are, like, trying to break into my office right now. But I feel like it's kind of 
on theme with your book, like that. So it works. It works. Uh, but thanks for hanging out with me today and getting to talk about The Last Tale of the Flower Bride, which is a book that got me out of a huge, very, very long reading slump. Um, I absolutely adored it. It is the perfect mix of like gothic, but also just very like a dark whimsy fairy tale. It's beautiful. It's super lyrical writing. I was so, so excited to get to read it. And I know that people, if they haven't read it yet, are going to absolutely love it. So I'm thrilled to be able to talk with you about it today. Um, and I wanted to ask first, if you could just tell everybody who is watching a little bit about the book and just maybe like an elevator pitch. Yes, a little. So the thing is, I actually think that it's best not to know too much about the story. But what I can tell you is this. The Last Tale of the Flower Bride is not a fantasy, but it is a fairy tale. And in the vein of many fairy tales, it is not real, but it is true. That's my pitch for the book. <laughs> All right, that is perfect. It does feel very like dark fairy tale. Um, I, I don't want to ask too much about the book. I do want to talk a little bit about the fairy tale elements and just know what went into research for that. Are you just like a uh, aficionado when it comes to fairy tales? Did you specifically research certain ones for the story? I, you know, it's, it's interesting. I think I, I devoured so many fairy tales growing up. And then I, when I got to college, I was a medievalist meaning that uh, my poor parents were so concerned. They were like, why did we immigrate for this person to essentially just be doing doing nothing or, or translating old Bibles or why is she still obsessed with Beowulf? Um, <laughs> and the thing is, I was exposed to even more fairy tales. It was the sense of you, you're, you're interacting with 14th century Breton lays, which drink from the roots of Celtic mythology, which drink from the roots of Roman mythology or Greek mythology. And the more stories that you consume, the more you realize that they have echoes across a spectrum of cultures. And so it felt a little bit like a historical deep dive. And it feels a little bit like getting your hands dirty. It's, it's archaeology without ever ruining a manicure. That's where I got exposed to those fairy tales. So I would say that a lot of the research was just the act of living and noticing and reading in general, and then watching how all these pieces fell together into a new story. Okay, that is the cool, did you say that was like a college major? Yeah, yeah. That is the coolest college major I've ever, ever heard of. How did you get into that? Like, how did you even discover that? I wouldn't know where to like <laughs> seek that out. You know, it was, um, it was, gosh, what, what was it? I'd heard really good things about the professor. I've heard, I'd heard that he, the way that he could make old material come alive was just absolutely enchanting. And I think that's, that's the mark of a wonderful educator, right? They can introduce you to something and make it absolutely luminous. And that's the same experience it was for me. I thought that otherwise, Old English, Middle English, these things felt like they were impenetrable. But in reality, they were like these gorgeous, gorgeous riddles. And they were insights and um, glimpses into the past. And they were still resonant years later. I mean, when you, we read something like Chaucer's Canterbury Tales and we come across the wife of Bath, that remains hilarious. It's, a, it's, it's hilarious throughout the ages. Um, and it's, one, it's just one of those funny things where... I, I just, I loved this. I loved the professor. I loved this, the material. And I was so fascinated by how unfamiliar it was to me that I just couldn't get enough of it. Okay. That is so cool. I wrote like professional questions beforehand and everything, but I feel like that is just, I want to know more about it. Like, did you always want to be an author? Did you, was there anything that led you to that specifically? Or was there another job that you wanted to do with that? What do you call a medievalist? Oh, gosh, I would have loved to be a medievalist, would have absolutely loved it. But it was it was not in my cards. I think whatever I wanted to be before an author was essentially the, you know, I don't know, truly unironically, it was like, can I be a sorcerer? Is there a, <laughs> is there a place where I can apply to do the thing that has the magic? And corny as it sounds and saccharine as it sounds, 
writing is the closest thing to it. What we get to do, the privilege of creating whole new worlds that hopefully readers get lost in, um, when we are able to channel characters who don't just come alive, don't just like make someone feel something, but they inspire fan fiction, they inspire fan art, they become real. That's a level of myth making that is to me the closest I can get to magic. I agree. The first job I ever wanted was to be the person to bring Pokemon to life. Um, so, you know, writing closest thing that you can get to that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but okay. So now with the last tale of the flower bride, this is your first adult book. You have written young adult, you have written middle grade, and now you've written adult, which is super, super impressive. First of all. So congratulations on this debut. It's also Thanks. just, again, super lovely. But was there any challenges moving into adult or was it even something you gave thought to when writing Flower Bride? I guess when I think about the challenges of moving into adult, in a lot of ways, it, it wasn't in the act of writing itself, right? I think, I think a lot about what Philip Pullman, who's one of my favorite authors of all time, and he's the author of His Dark Materials, if you haven't read it. Um, but Philip Pullman talked a lot about how our task as a writer when we're creating a story is a lot about where we place the camera. Um, it's just a lot about the lens and the viewpoint. And the incredible privilege of writing children's and young adult fiction is that we get to re-experience or revisit first emotions. You know, the moment when you fall in love for the first time, there's nothing like that emotion. I, I thought I was dying when I fell in love for the first time. And I was like, no one has ever felt this way before and they will <laughs> never feel it again. And that's the emotional range that you're, that you are, um, that you're exploring, but also that you're limited to in, in children's fiction and young adult. And so the challenge with adult was shifting the camera and realizing that you can still have these big emotions, but they're informed by a longer life. They're informed by more experiences. They're informed by ups and downs. And so that was, that was, that was the challenge for me, like how to emotionally tap into that in a different way. Um, otherwise though, I, I never really, it, it, it was odd. I didn't set out to like, it is time now for me to write an adult tale for the adults and people who have mortgages. Like there was, there was <laughs> it was nothing like that. It was simply, you know, we write the tales that we need to read or that we're desperate to, that we're, I don't know, that we, that we can't get out of our head and that we're desperate to get out of our head. And it was simply that story's time. Well, what a time. And I, I love that you can just navigate all those categories, it feels very, I mean, I don't know how it feels on your end, on my <laughs> end, like reading it, it feels just very fluid. Like I could definitely tell that is it's a Roshni book, but they all feel, you know, your middle grade feels very like fun and just, yeah, just so much fun and so much heart in it. And then this one just feels very, very dark, whimsy, lyrical. It's much heavier. Yeah, it's very, very impressive. I'm very impressed by you, but anyway. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. I'm glad I can still remain impressive even when my eyelash flops from my cheek and falls to the ground. <laughs> and you have to be like, you you lost something. <laughs> uh, okay, so I have a favorite scene early on in the book. Uh, I have a lot of favorite scenes, but this one feels less spoilery than some of the others. Okay. It is a very opulent scene and a very dark scene in the very first chapter um, I don't want to talk about it too much because I don't know if it's considered spoily, but I, I want to know if you have any favorite scenes. Mine involves a ring and yep. a glass. Okay. Is yeah. that one of your favorites too? <laughs> it is. It is. Okay. And it's not too spoiler, so spoilery, so we can totally dig into it. Um, okay. But it was inspired, and I'll tell you guys what happens. It was inspired by something that really happened to me which, but for, with, with context. So uh, a thousand years ago, not really, it felt like a thousand years ago. <laughs> Hilariously, it was right when the pandemic was beginning to make its way into the world. And uh, I remember the newspaper headline when my husband and I were in Tokyo, it said, a virus is coming. And <laughs> we were like, well, that's, that's unfortunate. Anyway, sorry, Asia. Little did we know it would be, it would be coming for us too. But we were in Tokyo at the time and we were running around, you know, exploring, having fun. And one day we stumbled into this hotel bar 
where it's the kind of hotel bar where you just feel poor breathing in the air. You're like, <laughs> I should not be here. <laughs> like, I should not be here at all. We sat down and we look at the menu and the drinks are starting at a hundred dollars or a hundred yen or whatever. And we're just like, yeah, we, we've got to get out. But then, but then something on the menu caught my eye and it was the option of a diamond martini. And I don't mean that this martini just came in an exceptionally frosted glass with a little rhinestone like rim. That's not what this thing was. The idea was that, and you have to imagine this place, it's full of these floor to ceiling um, glass windows. The chandeliers look like, they look like the bones of deep sea monsters. Everything is sort of a glow. The floor is too shiny. It looks liquid. Like you're going to fall straight through it and it's star flecked and you are just uncomfortable. You're just uncomfortable. And so what would happen for this menu is this bartender would come to your table and they would get this top shelf, dusty, unpronounceable vodka, and they would make this martini for you right in front of you. And after that, a jeweler would come in pushing a cart full of diamonds set out on velvet trays. And you would then select the diamond and put it in your glass and voila, diamond martini. We did not order this because that drink was ridiculously expensive. What we did do instead, however, was try to order the cheapest thing on the menu to see if we could find the person who was going to order it. What ended up happening was that a couple hours later, we're pointing at each other, slurring our speech. Why did you, why did you tell us to do this? You're a fool and we should have just bought a diamond martini <laughs> kind of said of this foolish bill we racked up. But I think about that a lot. And the, that scene ends up happening in the first chapter of Last Tale of the Flower Bride. And it's a really important scene to me because it defines the world in which Indigo lives in. It is one that is both opulent and also vulgar. Uh, and in that scene, the bridegroom, who's one of our narrators, sees that someone is ordering this drink. And when the guy orders it for his date, the date moves in to take the, the diamond out of the, out of the glass. And her, the man stops her and says, if you want it that badly, you can pick it out the next day. But if you want this drink, you're going to have to drink all of it. And uh, if you or any of your siblings ever had the misfortune of eating your mother's engagement ring when you were a toddler, you know that this is a pretty shitty situation, both literally and metaphorically. That's Indigo's world. That's what I really wanted to show. She is moving amongst people whose wealth puts them into a stratosphere that might as well be the other world. She's moving in a place that is vulgar and opulent and uncomfortable and disgusting, and yet you can't look away from that level of luxury. It's, it's poisonous, and it's, uh, it's delicious to write, it's delicious to observe, and I, I can take no part of it. <laughs> I've never had a diamond martini. <laughs> It set the tone for the book so well. I absolutely loved that scene. And I also loved uh, the House of Dreams in the book, which is where a large part of the story takes place. Again, I, I feel like we don't, like like you said, this book is better left like unspoiled. So I don't want to venture too much into it. But you are really, really talented at writing like sentient homes in a sense. So I just wanted to know if anything inspired it or if you could talk a little bit about that setting. Yeah, um, I really appreciate that compliment. Hilariously, my my middle grade editor has said almost the exact same thing. Uh, I can't seem to get away from putting sentient houses in any of my stories. And that's what she said was, uh, you excel at writing sentient domiciles. And, and I was I was just laughing because I, I don't think I'd ever seen the word domicile written out. <laughs> long time. But I was like, thanks, Steph. <laughs> um, but you know, the, the inspiration for that came from a couple different places. You know, when I, when I really think about one of the things that Last Tale of the Flower Bride is about, it's about the tension of growing up. It's the push-pull of wanting to stay in the magical realm of childhood, this age of innocence that allows you to perceive magic, um, to believe in fairyland, and not just believe in it, but know that it really is there. And then the course of growing up, that this is the cost of growing up, that when you enter the adult world, you must leave some of it behind. And for many of us, that means abandoning that magic. 
Um, whether you had an imaginary friend that you could see up until a certain age and then you just chalk it up to, I guess that was childhood. And gosh, what a small tragedy that you don't actually know, um, that you can't access that part of your brain anymore. And I'm very curious about the places in which we grow up, which bear witness to those extremely vulnerable and magical years. Um, when my family moved me and my siblings, I remember that I missed my childhood house so, so much that I used to write it letters. And I would cry wondering if, it, if the house missed me as much as I missed it. So that's a little bit about where um, the House of Dreams came from, a place that was sort of alive, a place that could love you back because it had seen the best and the worst of you. And um, something that didn't make it into the final draft, but which was sort of at the back of my head, is this Japanese concept of hitobashira, which is the practice of burying somebody alive under the foundations of a home or a fortress or some other sort of building. The point being that eventually the, so the spirit of the deceased person is somehow then just absorbed into the foundations of this home. It's, it's in the brick, it's in the stone. The house is now alive and, and um, able to perceive things, able to protect you, but it needs an exchange you know, of offerings, of stories, of companionship. That's, those are some of the inspirations I had when coming up with the House of Dreams. Oh, that is awesome. I feel like that is just such a cool setting. It's such a magical setting and it just lends itself to the book so, so well. But okay, so I've read many of your books at this point. And I would <laughs> certainly say that this one is is the most haunting. Like it's beautiful, it's opulent, but also like you said, it's very vulgar, it's very dark. Um, and I want to know, was writing this a cathartic experience in any way or was it difficult to kind of inhabit that darkness um it was really cathartic to write you know it's it's funny because i i think i've referred to a lot of my books in the past as um my book babies my book children or blah 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 and then when i look at the how uh, when i look at the last hill of the flower bride i just think you are a horcrux okay there's nothing <laughs> like you are a dark <laughs> flensed off piece of my soul and I love you, but I don't want to revisit you ever again. Um, <laughs> when I was writing Flower Bride and I was thinking a lot about that push pull of growing up, I was actually thinking a lot about what I was like when I was a teenage girl. Um, when you're, and this is not just specific to teenage girls, but I would say I have never been more of a lawless feral, amoral creature than when I was between the ages of 14 to 17. Just unstoppable. I mean, me and my best friends, we ran around in packs. Nobody went to the bathroom by themselves. Maybe everybody had the same crush on the same person. And it was fine. It wasn't messy. It was like, well, he'll love us back one by one. <laughs> messy, messy. <laughs> it really is extremely odd. Um, but when you get older, I think one of the things that we have a hard time grappling with is the shame of all the people that we've been in the past. We're sort of embarrassed by, oh God, we really, we really leaned very, very far into our panic at the disco moment. Um, <laughs> or there's all these phases that we have, some of which are cute and cringy and some of which we're forced to think are, my God, we were really cruel. And how do you make peace with that? Because I, even at 32, I still think that the person I'm dragging around with me is the girl in seventh grade who doesn't know where she's going to sit when she enters the cafeteria. And it's that sense of vulnerability. Um, those were a lot of the things that I was, that I was feeling when I was writing Flower Bride. And uh, it, it found its way a lot into one of the main fairy tales that is sort of a through line um, throughout the book, which is the tale of Catskins. Uh, I think Catskins is probably the most disturbing fairy tale that I'd ever come across. It goes by other names, uh, Donkey Skins, Aller Lera. Uh, if you've read Deerskin by Robin McKinley, there's a lot of similarities. If you're Catholic and are familiar with St. Dymphna, the saint, a lot of overlap there. Um, and just to give some back background on the story, it's the, in it, um, 
there is a king and his wife is on her, her deathbed. And she tells him that he is not allowed to remarry until or unless he finds a woman who equals her in beauty. And lo and behold, their infant daughter grows up and she is the spitting image of her mother. And when the father tries to force this monstrous marriage on her, she demands three gifts. Uh, one is a, a, a dress that's as beautiful as sunlight, another a dress as beautiful as moonlight, one that a dress that rivals starlight. And the last thing she asks for is a fur made from all the skins of the animals in her father's kingdom. And with that, she runs away. And she does find a happy ending, but I found myself thinking over and over about the layer of armor that we have when we're trying to escape something. All these pieces of ourselves that we're forced to hide under or that we're forced to, or that we are unable to shed until we truly feel safe. So that was definitely a big part of Flower Bride and, and why it was a cathartic book to write. It's sort of a, a reconciling of many monsters. Well, on that note, <laughs> <laughs> we're diving into the fun questions. <laughs> Um, I wrote a series of, I was going to have this be like a speed round because I usually do speed round questions, but some of them I went a little overboard with, so they don't have to be speed round, but okay. Some okay. of them a little fast. So favorite fairy tale. Oh, crap. <laughs> Bluebeard. Bluebeard. Okay. Yes. Are there any fairy tales that you would like to put yourself into to discover what happens next? Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> This is delicious to find out what happens next. You know, I've always found Jack and the Beanstalk a little like a missed interior decorating opportunity or just like, like a kind of thing where you're like, but what else is, is up there? Can't we just, you know, linger <laughs> and go find out and explore? That was always very... Um, yeah, I don't know. It, not, not not necessarily the sexiest of fairy tales, but certainly the one where I was like, I feel like he got out of there too fast. Um, so. Yeah. So that, that one's your pick, Jack and the Beanstalk? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Are there any fairy tales that you would rewrite? I would like to rewrite Snow White. Ooh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I one of the things, and I know it's sort of our speed round, but I, gosh, the thing about fairy tales and myths that makes them so vital to us is that they they give us something every time we revisit them, whether they're meant to explain the unexplainable or they're even just supposed to say, yeah, things are kind of horrible out in the real world. Anyway, uh, don't eat this poisoned apple, move on. Snow White was one of those first stories that um, I'd, I'd read in Neil Gaiman's short story when I was in middle school or high school. And it was it was a reimagining of Snow White, but from the perspective of the, quote, evil stepmother. And he was pointing out things that we just sort of take for granted in the story. You know, he was like, so Snow White comes back from the dead. You got this necrophiliac prince <laughs> and everybody's like, yeah, this is fine. This is actually not fine. Um, <laughs> and then it seems like the the stepmother is the only one who is like, this child is a vampire. She has looked, she, this is not a, a happy kid. She, she's, she's been pale. She's not just anemic. We tried the iron supplements. Nothing is working. Um, there's something just sort of unsettling about Snow White that I, I still find delicious. Yeah. Well, I look forward to reading that one day. Um, I have a couple more questions, but just to remind everybody, if you want to ask a question, go ahead and do it now so we can dive into the ask box uh, once these are through. Okay. So you get to eat one meal or one sweet for the rest of your life. All the rest are just magicked away forever. What do you pick? One meal or one sweet? Mm-hmm. Mm. That's funny. I know what my last meal would be. <laughs> If I was, if I was going to like die tomorrow, I know what I'd eat, <laughs> but I don't know what I eat every single day. Ah, gosh. If I was restricted to one candy, it would be, it would be Swedish fish. I just really like the taste of chemical cherries. So <laughs> they're just a delight. Just a good, gosh darn delight. Right, well, you were going to sustain yourself on that for the rest of your life. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You are out for a walk and you stumble across a door. There's nothing else around it. And yet you feel a sense of magic that draws you to it. 
what does your door look like? And if you could open it and have it take you to one place, where would you demand the store take you? Oh, Ooh. <laughs> I love this. I think, oddly, I think my door would be made of ice and glass and it would look like one of those things where it's, you, you know, if you look at the entries, the entrance of churches in a lot of these beautiful Baroque places where there's like this sort of moving tableau through it. And you, you're, you wonder maybe if you're looking at it just right, if something's going to like turn its head really fast. That's what my door would look like. And I think when I open it, I think it would take me to, uh, well, it would it would take me to a place in, on midnight, in midnight. But I don't actually know if the place is real. I think a lot about that one scene from the stories about the brothers turned into swans and how it's a sort of midnight lake, it would be that kind of place. This, this, this lake at midnight where when you reach it, you, you can be temporarily transformed. And not an, not, an, not an evil one, just a very gentle transformation. Like uh, briefly you're a silver fish and not like the one that roaches fight with, but like truly like a fish that with silver scales or briefly you're, I don't, I don't even know. I don't know, a swan. And then you can go back to whatever it is because the door won't abandon you. I'm very scared of being abandoned on the other side of doors. I look forward to reading that book too. Have you ever <laughs> watched or I, I think, I mean, I don't know if it's in the book. I don't remember it, but Howl's Moving Castle. Oh gosh. Compl I just, I, that was my entire personality from the ages of like 10 to 14. Yeah. <laughs> that Like your lake scene, it's, it's quite different, but that reminded me like in the movie yes. when you go watch Howl. Okay. Right. Uh, yes. He gets uh, counted. I love that scene so much where he Me just too. swallows him up. But okay. If you could distill any publishing memory into a perfume and have it be vividly remembered whenever sprayed, what would you choose? A memory from publishing. Yeah. I didn't want to make it too personal. So I picked publishing. Memory from <laughs> publishing. You know, here's, here's the thing. And I, it's not exactly a happy answer, but I think it's an important one. And it is that when my debut, The Star Touch Queen, came out, I remember that I, I did an event. It was my very first time being on tour. And I did an event at Books of Wonder, which, which was lovely. And it had a whole panel of authors. And I had never seen a place that crowded. And the idea of so many people wanting to listen to me, that was insane. And then the riding off of that high, the very next day, I went to a different store in a different city and nobody was there. Like no one was there. And I felt really, really embarrassed. And in a way, that's the memory. Yeah, that's the memory I would pick. This moment of a lot of people watching and nobody watching because the hardest thing when you're creating stories is remembering how to keep them sacred just to you. Because what we do, and I, I wonder if, you, and I'm sure you feel this way too, but I'm wondering like how, how you grapple with it. But like, for example, with Flower Bride, all the hard work of that story was done a year and a half ago. It was done in edits and revisions and the sort of quiet tending and devotional whatever of showing up every day for that book. The minute it was done and line edits were done and copy edits were done, the book ceased to belong to me. And it became less about who are you writing this for and rather like what is the next thing you can write for yourself? Because whether it's a crowded room or an empty room, it it doesn't really matter to the story. And it doesn't really, it doesn't have any actual bearing on our ability to, to make art. So... <laughs> Yeah, I think that is a great answer. And yeah, it's something very kind of difficult to grapple with as a creative. And it's it's constantly on my mind as well. And like you say, once yeah. you kind of finish that project, it's just gone. And then a year later, when you're already so deep in something new is when it's time to like try to revisit that one and talk about yeah. it with people. And it's, yeah, it's very, it's weird. It messes with your brain. It really does. Because in a, an odd way, we're we are living in the past when we do mm -hmm. these sorts of like, we're celebrating a book release. We're like, yes, but in my mind, it's, it's already a museum piece in my imagination or something. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's one of the, the great 
and beautiful lonelinesses of making loneliness is not a real word. Again, I have a crack in, so uh, she's eating my brain cells. But just that idea of how do you make something when you feel like no one is watching? And if you can cling to that, that's a really, really powerful place to write from. Yeah. And it would probably smell very lovely as a perfume. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe some bergamot. Uh, <laughs> okay. I have one more question for you. And that's okay. just, so once upon a time before you and I had ever spoken, I went to y'all fest and I heard you on a panel and, <laughs> and I was, I was like, who was this person talking about a Santa Claus book? <laughs> I just, I don't, I don't know. This isn't even really a question. This is just a petition to hopefully one day get a sexy Santa Claus book from you because that panel was hilarious. And to everybody listening, uh, we were promised, I guess not really promised, but it was alluded to hopefully one day getting a book about maybe the origin story of Santa or maybe just a sexy Santa Claus. I have no idea, but <laughs> will you write a sexy Santa Claus book ever? Maybe. Is it still on the table? Um, I can't tell you, but I will tell you that I think you might be happy in the okay, near. so it's still a possibility. It's a, it's a po so the funny thing is, so how this whole thing came about was hanging out with some of my wonderful author friends the, the night before Y'all Fest, which is in Charleston, and uh, much whiskey was partaken in. And <laughs> that <laughs> evening, I was talking about like, doesn't anyone think it's just sort of weird that Santa Claus is just by himself in the North Pole wearing this bright red coat? I mean, <laughs> and then takes another sip of whiskey and it's just like, what if he was exiled there? What if the red coat is a coat of penance? It's a oh. coat of just, you know, being thrown out into the cold. And what did he do wrong? What if he was a warlord? And what if it's a red that's steeped in blood? And, you know, most importantly, what if he actually looks like Henry Cavill or, or Oscar <laughs> Isaac? And uh, my friend, Renee Atier, who's the author of The Wrath and the Dawn and many other fabulous stories, she looked at me and she was like, just eat some fries and drink some water. <laughs> this is pretty good advice when one is, well, anyway. And then the next day on this panel, she she was asked to share her worst book idea. And uh, she just, I mean, she threw me right under the bus. She's like, I don't have one. Let me tell you what Roshni said last night <laughs> and volunteered my dumb story. And here's, here's the thing though. Even when you start off with a story that is absolutely wackadoo, It'll sometimes surprise you when you poke at it. And I, I'm kind of embarrassed to say that even poking at a, the ridiculousness of a Santa Claus origin story has somehow become this soft meditation on dreams and the necessity of hope. And I kind of hate myself, but at the same time, <laughs> art. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, it seems like you've given quite a lot of thought to this. So I will, I will, con I will continue to hope. But like, would it have changed if his coat was blue? I like, think so. I think it's a completely different, it's a completely different tale. Because it's a necessity that the coat is red. It's the color of something just, it's, you know, it's the color of life. Blood. So, <laughs> I guess the real problem is that I even gave thought to this. That That's, I mean, I, I like to think that I'm a bit of an eloquent trash can and, um, you know, a polished trash can. And a shiny one, but a trash can nonetheless. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will continue to hope. And with that, I will dive into the question box. Okay. Is there a genre you're scared or intimidated by, but would actually love to write one day? James asks this question. Hi, James. Um, I would really like to tackle an epic fantasy one day. But at the same time, that is so much work and so much world building and you know the the great joy of world building is that our job as an author as as an artist is is kind of to construct these glaciers right like when you consider what a glacier appears like to you you only see a little bit of it on the top and yet you know that there's this massive structure holding it underneath and that's kind of the the glorious challenge of epic fantasy that i I'm intimidated by, but I'm also really drawn to. What about you, Adeline? 
exactly the same. Like I think yeah. about it all the time. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, I would love to do that. Like as I'm watching the new Lord of the Rings, the Rings of Power show, or yeah. I'm watching like the new Game of Thrones and stuff. I'm like, yes, this fantasy dragons, elves, everything. That sounds so much fun. But then like I look at the books of Game of Thrones and how many characters there are and how like the backstory is it, the backstory alone deserves like 20 books. I'm like, oh, that's a lot. That's yeah. It's too much. So. <laughs> yeah, I really have to like sit down and think and solely think for like three years before I could even write the first chapter. <laughs> yeah, completely. Um, okay, Tori says, this question is for Miss Roshni, your writing is so beautiful and stunning, but surely such artistic writing doesn't come effortlessly. What are your methods for fighting writer's block if you get it? And what else might you do to get some inspiration and get the creative juices flowing? Oh, well, thank you. I'm, I'm glad that I'm glad you like the writing. Um, it doesn't come naturally. Uh, well, yeah, no, it doesn't come naturally. I think a certain joy in the way you look at something and consider something is is always part of the, the writing. I'm sorry, that doesn't make any sense. But when I, uh, I think a lot about sentences that really sort of s stopped me in my tracks. Um, and oftentimes they're not really overly descriptive. They're just, they're moving, but they do a lot of heavy lifting um, in, in an economy of language. Uh, one example is from uh, All the Light We Cannot See, which is a beautiful, beautiful book. And one of the characters in it is blind and it describes this scene in which she is given a can, a, a, a peach from a canned peach. And it's like during war and rationing and everything. And it's described as the, um, the peach tasted like wet sunlight. And I just, I still think about that all the time. The peach tasted like wet sunlight, just beautiful. So when I feel stuck and, and I have writer's block and I don't quite know how to move forward in a story, usually that tells me that I've, um, I've lost my way somewhere beforehand. Because I think if, you are, if you've lost the emotion of the story, it's really, really hard to move forward in it. So when I hit those sort of junctures, I either reread the books that make me want to write. Um, some of my favorite rereads are Deathless by Catherine Valenti. I'm a massive Angela Carter fan. I love rereading Daughter of Smoke and Bone by Lainey Taylor. Mm. All of those books are so glorious and the writing is an extremely rich and almost tactile. Those are the stories that I reread to make me want to write. And then on the flip side of that, because as I said before, I am a trash can, I will then read the books that I absolutely hate like the absolute ones I hate. And I was like, can't believe somebody got paid to do this. I can do this too. So motivation really goes both ways. Um, and as a final and last resort for writer's block, I put my, um, you know, the, the mortgage statement uh, for the month and I just tap it, just tape it onto the wall. And I look at it and I think, you actually can't afford to not finish this book. I'm like, that's a good point. And then off I go. So those are the, the, many, the many wells of inspiration from which I drink. Yeah, the mortgage one's where I'm at with this book right now. <laughs> Man, I'm just like, well, you had to have a house like Ram Ram. <laughs> like, anyway. My you dogs have get, to eat. <laughs> you couldn't get by on a yurt, you fool. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I think this is an anonymous one. It just says, how did you prepare before starting to write this book? How did I prepare? Um... I started going to therapy and that was really helpful. Um, so <laughs> the first time in my life, to be totally honest. I, I don't think I, what's an interesting thing when we consider how we prepare to sit down and write a story. I think that I'm someone who loves a lot of ceremony. I really, I love ceremony. Um, and from the experience of writing Arusha on the End of Time and the Gilded Wolves trilogy at the same time meant that I had to be really, really protective about the mental space I allowed myself to get into before I started writing them. For me, the way that I kept those stories separate was through candles and was scent memory. So I would write Arusha to um, like, gosh, what was it? 
I think I sometimes wrote Arusha to a really bright and happy peppermint candle. And then I wrote the Gilded Wolves to the smell of a tomato candle. I don't know why, but these sort of things kept them separate in my head. And it was kind of similar for Flower Bride. Uh, it was a book that for whatever reason, even if I was in the same, like even if I was in like pajamas that probably should have been burned by that point and my hair was just like slicked back in this petrified Teletubby bun, I would still put on the same perfume every single day. And there was, it was a mix of two. One of them was Aqua della Regina, which is a scent that you can get from Santa Maria Novella in Florence and is one of the original fragrances of Catherine de' Medici. Uh, and it's, it's incredible. And obviously it translates to water of the queen. And the other fragrance that I always wore when I was writing Flower Bride was, um, oh, and now I can't remember what it's called. Something roses, <laughs> something, <laughs> something with a lot of roses that was also unpronounceable and acquired in a very pretentious Perugian apothecary nonsense thing. And uh, that was how I prepared to write the book. It was the sort of things that got me wrapped into the story. Alan, do you write to like a particular, do you have a writing candle or anything like that? What yeah, like I actually do. I have a candle for the Belladonna series. It's um, Baltic Amber, Veluspa, Baltic Amber. Yeah. Yeah, I love, yeah. oh, it smells so good. And a playlist. So I listen like exclusively to Peter Gundry uh, when I write that series. Do you, do you yeah. have a, do you do playlists? Um, before I start writing, yes. I can't okay. actually write music. Although I, now I really feel like I also have to send you a tomato candle because, so have I told you this fun fact about tomatoes? I, I, probably not. I've never even heard of a tomato candle. I didn't know they yeah. had tomatoes in candle form. They they're incredible and they smell like ex, ex they smell like exceptional dirt which is doesn't sound like a freaking endorsement <laughs> but you're just like man if i was a farmer i would just be like i'm gonna be rich from this dirt <laughs> but so fun fact about tomatoes the latin name for tomato is lycopersicum which translates to wolf peach and that was because once upon a time in ye old medieval days, they believed that eating a tomato would turn you into a full freaking werewolf. You ate it, you were bound to just like morph into some sort of creature. That's and so cool. It's so, it's, it's cool and it's random because you're like, what did a poor humble tomato do? Ah, and yet tomatoes are in the same family as Belladonna, our deadly nightshade. And so there might be this strange sort of, agricultural folkloric overlapping where they were like, well, that person ate a tomato and that person ate a thing that kind of looked like tomato and then they died. Or maybe they became a wolf because we never really found him. Don't eat tomatoes. <laughs> I, just, I love words. They're so, they're so delightful. <laughs> Have you ever read the Cinder series by Marissa Meyer? Yes. Okay. There's, I think it's the second one. One of the characters, Wolf, I think it's Wolf. I might be making that up and mixing things around, but eats tomatoes. And I was so, I guess, influenced by this as a youth. I was as like, I, I too will eat tomatoes as if they were apples. And I, <laughs> I remember I had like my mom go to the grocery store and get like the ripest tomato possible. And I just, <laughs> I took a bite of that thing. Like it was an apple and I, it was not, it was not the oh. book lied to me. But. The book, oh man! I mean, I can pop those <laughs> like those cherry tomatoes. Like, yeah, I, I eat a gallon of them in a sit in one sitting. I'll just be like, nom nom nom. They're so good. <laughs> but a whole freaking like one of those like steak tomatoes. Yeah, they're I described think. deliciously in the book, so I had to try it, but it was not for me. Some um. books lie to you. Some like I mean. The way that C.S. Lewis made Turkish delight sound. Oh my gosh, that was one of my questions. I forgot to ask you that. Shoot. What, <laughs> I, what, what are my questions? Delight. Yes. It's not okay. That good. I don't like it. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, what was the? Okay. Here's my original question. You step through a wardrobe and into another world where you come across a beautiful white witch who offers you a Turkish delight. Do you take it? But now I'm swapping it out to that artificial cherry thing that is your last meal. Do you take it? <laughs> Uh, no. Okay, I, I can't don't. believe I forgot to ask you that. <laughs> yeah, but that's a, but you know, that's the thing. I, I would have to, I would really need to be studying the scene. It, would she just be like, ooh, would you like this yummy, delicious, artificial <laughs> thing? Or would it, 
would it be like have this cherry cherry to <laughs> cherry tomato i would also <laughs> probably eat a cherry tomato offered to me by a beautiful witch <laughs> but it would be like well what would i get is it just because i i look like i need to have more lycopene in my system or <laughs> throw it on antioxidants so why is this being offered to me is a, is a very important follow-up question before I ate it. <laughs> that's, that, that's fair because like when I wrote the question, I was like, oh, this seems magical. But like in my head, it was that scene from Enchanted where the squirrel is like, or the chipmunk is like, apple, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? So like, it's good. It's good. good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Okay. I have another real question. Okay. Uh, what was your writing process like? Was the whole story planned out or was it more of a figure it out as you go? So are you a pantser or a plotter? I, you know, it's interesting. I think I'm going to steal my answer from Neil Gaiman that I'm neither a, a pantser or a plotter, but that I'm an obsessor and I follow the thing that I'm obsessed with. And that was a lot about, that was a lot that informed the writing of Last Hell, the Flower Bride. It was, I had... I had known key scenes throughout the story that I just could not wait to get to. And those were the things that I was sort of reverse engineering the story around. Um, and then otherwise, you know, one of the challenges with it is that we have two points of view and those points of views take place in different timelines. So it was probably one of the first stories I've written where it truly was linear. I had to start from the very beginning and then just sort of write, figure out how every single chapter was echoing something that would come before, or come after. And it became this very intricately braided process of writing. And it would not have been possible without the genius of my editor, Jessica Williams, and my other editor, Julia Elliott, who weighed in a lot on the story. And at one point during our revisions, they had sent down a scene breakdown. This is what happens in this chapter, then this chapter, then this chapter. And it was like getting a high level look at all the things that needed to happen in the story and how we make it more, how, how we have, how we provoke a, a deeper emotional response beyond just like, I just really wanted to write that. <laughs> a lot. I feel like a lot of newer writers are like a little bit afraid of the idea of an editor, but like a good editor really is. Oh my God. They're uh, so That's, good. So, yeah. so good. I have been I so, so lucky with the editors that I've had the chance to work with um, over the past 10, almost 10 years or so. And every single one of them has made me just rethink something, reapproach something. It's made the writing stronger, um, sharper. And it's really funny because I feel that the one thing, the one criticism all my editors have in common is that I am really bad at describing visual spaces. It's a lot of just like, but where, huh. Roshni, where are we? I'm like, I don't know, but shiny. And then I try to keep <laughs> going, no, no, no. Where are we? <laughs> Please situate us in time and space. I'm like, fine, I guess. That's so interesting. Cause like when I'm reading it, I, I feel like everything is so descriptive and just very like, it's like you're in it. So I don't notice that. So good job. I'm glad. Well, because it, you know, the descriptive the thing is I would be talking about how something would make a character feel, but it's, it's almost too, it can get too vibey and you're just like, yeah, love the vibes, but where, where are we? <laughs> <laughs> you have told me what this room feels like. And nothing else about it. <laughs> that is hilarious. Yes, uh, okay. This is a serious question. Oh, no. Where do you find a tomato candle? I got mine from a place called Candlefish in Atlanta, which I think has now shut down. But I will do my best to find you a tomato candle and make sure that it is sent to your home. <laughs> okay. Well, it I actually, yeah, I would love to know what that smells like. It wasn't my question, but I will happily accept this tomato candle. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Uh, what are some recent ways you like to refill the creative well? Oh, uh, to me, it's always, re it's reading something, whether it's rereading a story or, you know, diving into that ridiculously intimidating stack of the one's TBR. Um, <laughs> Of late, I find that I am really enjoying rereading middle grade and um, rereading the old middle grade, like the, the stuff that was just 
that I just reread over and over and over again. Uh, one of them for me was El Enchanted by Gail Carson Levine. I think that was one of the very first fairy tale retellings I'd ever read that uh, it felt like it felt like I was being let in on a secret. I wasn't even I, I didn't even know that you got to that you could do that with an old story and make it your own. Uh, and then another book I've been I reread recently, which was just a delight, was uh, Witch Witch by Eva Ibbotson. Um, the premise is incredible. I wish that someone would write this for me. It's basically The Bachelor with witches, and uh, for some reason, it's for children. It's it's great. <laughs> <laughs> I love middle grade audiobooks so much. I think that they are just like the most delightful, fun thing ever because they get all like the different voices. And, yes. and I wish that like more, more, na more narrators for like young adult and adult and stuff did that. Like the, Thanks. just the fun voices. It's so entertaining. Um, I think we might have time for one more. Do you have any advice for young writers? This is from, oh, I might mispronounce your name. I'm sorry. Sneha. And they love your books, by the way. Thanks, Neha. <laughs> my advice for young writers, you know, my advice for young writers and old writers and ancient writers and undead writers is pretty much all the same. And, and that is to read widely and with, and read widely and without judgment. Um, so much of what we do as storytellers isn't about how bejeweled our prose seems or how, um, how many twists and turns are in our plots. It's so much about whether or not we succeed in making you feel something. That's where, to me, a story lives or dies on. It lives or dies on whether I can alter your emotional state in any way. And I think that when you read widely, it broadens your capacity to be compassionate and empathetic. It lets you live a thousand different lives. It lets you be millions of different people. Um, I think maybe I stole that from someone. I think I might have taken it from George R. R. Martin. I can't remember. Uh, but that's that's my, my advice would be to read without judgment and to read very, very widely. I'm actually going to ask one more quick question. This is mine. Do you have any quick book recommendations of something you just recently loved? Oh, gosh. Okay. So I'm actually, my editor was bringing it up to me today and I'm pulling up the I can't remember the name of the author right now, but I'm almost done with Jenny Offill's Department of Speculation, which is a really tiny novel that is uh, destroying me. And I'd heard about it and I'd never read it. And now I'm reading it and I'm like in a lot of intense pain. The other book I'm almost done with is a nonfiction called The Fabric of Civilization, which is about textiles. And yes, you are correct. It is absolutely freaking riveting. And then the last book I'm reading, where is it? I don't know where it went. And now I can't remember where it went. Uh, well, I'll tell you what I just finished, which is um, my husband and I were reading out loud the Epic of Gilgamesh to the Kraken. Uh, we haven't really, <laughs> when I think about the stories that we've been reading out loud to Kraken, I think we could do better, but why? <laughs> <laughs> So that's, that's what I've been reading. <laughs> I'm going to write all those down. <laughs> what about you, Adeline? Um, I just recently read Emily Wilde's Encyclopedia of Fairies, which oh. I freaking adored. It was absolutely adorable and magical, and I loved the romance in it. Yes, I also read that. I absolutely loved it. It was so, so, so good. So good. It was so good. Yeah. You know what I, th when I think about how great Emily Wilde is, it's, it's one of those stories that is so gentle and yet where it really, really thrives. And it's, it's something that my, my adult editor had told me a lot when we were writing, when we were revising Flower Bride, she kept pushing me on being precise. And I really think that's really valuable writing advice. Like when you're world building or when you're doing a ton of atmosphere, you want to be as precise as possible. And Emily Wilde is a, a very precise book. It is so specific and it's magic. And I think that's what makes it feel so um, lived in and it's just so, ah, just so good. That's a good note. I'd never heard that before. Yeah. 
I think about that a lot. Like, why is my favorite fantasy my favorite fantasy? And it's because there's no, it's, it's extremely specific and it doesn't, it, it grapples with its own world building and it never shies away from anything. We're so fortunate that you could at least do this virtual event with us, Roshni. Thank you so much for being here. Um, and congratulations on the upcoming Kraken. I hope once it emerges, it brings ruin to your enemies. That is the best. Um, I love that. I'm going to cling to that. Thank you guys so much for being here. Um, Adeline, you are incredible as always. You are genius. I love all your stories. I appreciate you for watching my back and making sure that my eyelashes <laughs> stay on. This is just like proof. I mean, I'm going to send you a tomato candle and thanks. Maybe the one eyelash that fell off too. And, and readers, thank you so much for listening. Uh, we hope that you had a great time. And I, I really hope that the last tale of the flower bread resonates with you. It was it was a joy to answer your questions. I hope you guys had fun. Thank you all so much. It is a lovely, lovely book. If you have not read it yet or picked it up, I cannot recommend it more. <laughs> you still have time and we still have books. Yes. All right, everyone. <laughs> I hope you have a great evening, day, or whatever if you're watching this in the future. I hope we see you at the next virtual event or even in-store event. Bye. 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 <laughs>